شارج جنا أستبوي عن زجاجت بيرش عن الوقت خليجي مشين لله سنة أغسط كل سنة لعبوا مبوي سنة أغسط بق بات بات Супер. Ну и наши тут 8 танков. 8 танков? Да. 8 танков. Где ты подбивал танки, скажи? В трампарке 7 с ленточкой в городе, там, в 1 майском 4. С чем-то? Гранатами и бутылками? Бутылками. 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 Солярка, кельсина. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Ladies and gentlemen, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to the Black Banners podcast. This is episode 6 and today we are shedding light on the story of Samir Saleh Abdullah Suwailim, a forgotten hero from Arabia, a contemporary mujahid who defended the lands of the mujahideen and gave up a life of luxury and success to fight for the Muslim Ummah. Everybody knew him as Amir ibn al-Khattab. A war name that he took on due to his intrigue regarding the nature of Umar ibn al-Khattab, al-Farooq, and his punishing yet fair nature. I was very honest. 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 Born in the far north of Saudi Arabia in the city of Ar'ar on April 14, 1969, he is by far the most recent fighter that we've ever featured on the Black Banners podcast. Some reports say that he was born in Jordan in 1963, but most people agree that that's most likely not the case. As a young man, his father used to take him and his brothers into the Saudi mountains and hills to train, and he would always make sure that he won his races against his brothers. He was extremely competitive. He was fascinated with recordings of battles and training and home videos of Mujahideen. And this is another thing that led him later to film his campaigns. His brothers weren't as interested in it, clearly as he was. Khattab had a calling for this. He spoke English, Russian, Arabic, and Pashto, of course not immediately. He learned this over his years of combat in different countries. His family was overall financially well off, and they had pretty good connections as most Arabian families tended to have with the West. He was studying for a Saudi oil company called Aramco, and he was bound to have a bright future with immense success like many of his Arabian comrades. He worked for them for six months and graduated high school around the same time, specializing in the sciences, and he was well known for his academic excellence, receiving a 94% on the evaluation exam. He was set on a very good academic course. He was actually meant to go study in the United States in 1987 when he turned 18, but he did not end up in the States. Instead, he landed in Jalalabad around the same time, where his Afghani brothers were facing the Soviets. As soon as he turned 18, with some reports saying that he was there at 17, he decided to answer the call for jihad to go and defend the land of his Afghani brothers and sisters against the atheist Soviets. And so he sets off with some of his Arabian comrades and lands in Afghanistan in 1987, where he was admitted into a training camp outside Jalalabad. His trainers were shocked at his response time and how quickly he could adapt and learn all the new machinery. And so he was put on the field very quickly. He started to catch a lot of attention for his extreme success in this style of combat, guerrilla warfare, and he was involved in most of the operations against the Soviets through 1988 and fought until 1993 when Kabul was finally liberated as well as Khost and Jalalabad from the Soviet loyalists and warlords. During these operations, he became well known for plucking Russian choppers one after the other and executing rapid attacks cornering Russian convoys in the mountains, killing the operatives and taking their weaponry. During the conquest quest of Jalalabad, one of the brothers broke into an intelligence center and read the reports, which were completely filled with just Khattab's name. 
listing consecutive attack after attack. Khattab was an ace with the RPG and heavy artillery. His accuracy was well known by the Afghans and better known by the Russians. <laughs> The respect he received from his men was very clear, as well as his humility despite his clear distinctiveness. Khattab was special, and that is why he began to retain authority among the Mujahideen and become a commander trainer. <laughs> It was around this time that he finally left Afghanistan and followed the Russians to Tajikistan in 1993, following the conquest of Jalalabad, where he continued to fight for two more years. The journey through Tajikistan was extremely difficult, specifically because of the terrain, which lost them most of their equipment. Considering their limited supplies, it was quite difficult to get through the rivers and mountains of Tajikistan in the first place. They had around 100 to 120 men and were joined by around 400 Tajik Mujahideen. And during these two years, he lost a few fingers off his hand to a grenade explosion. Explosion. His men urged him to get it treated, but he threw some honey on it and put a glove on and called it a day. What an absolute unit. He had fought in Tajikistan for two years in the Tajik Civil War, and he returned to Afghanistan with his men to regroup and resupply. And by resupply, I mean a few extra walkie-talkies. At this time, he had met with some of his old Mujahid comrades in Afghanistan, and he toured a training camp there. But something else was happening around the world at the same time. But for context, we need to rewind a few years to 1991, specifically October 27th, 1991. Zohar Dudayev just won an election in Chechnya with 90% of the popular vote. The former head of the branch of the Communist Party in Grozny had passed away a month and a half earlier on September 6th after falling out of a window actually trying to escape Dudoyev. And with that, his party fell as well. And with Dudoyev's victory, he declared full independence from the Russian Federation and prepared to face them. And per usual, Russia sat quietly and decided, you know what, we've put these people through enough. Let's, let's let them go, you know, they've earned it. Um, they're running their own elections now. Yeah, just kidding. In mid-November 1991, Yeltsin dispatched troops to overtake Dudoyev, who were surrounded and sent back in the airport that they came in. The oppositional forces, aka Russia's slaves in Chechnya, aka the puppet Chechen government, suited up to face Dudoyev from their positions outside Chechnya. They were forced out into Russian-controlled regions. They staged multiple coup d'etats that failed miserably. Every advance the oppositional forces made was rushed and quickly destroyed by Dudoyev and the Chechens. In late October 1992, Russian forces near Ossetia were dispatched to the Chechen border. Dudoyev declared a state of emergency and threatened general mobilization if the troops did not withdraw. After another failed attack in December of 1993, yeah, they're really chipping away at this. The oppositional forces got on their knees and started to beg Russia for help. And with support from Moscow, they led a joint attack on Dudoyev in August of 1994 that was easily swatted. They regrouped and received an immense amount of support from the Kremlin and launched their largest attack to date a few months later on November 26, 1994. With Russian artillery and equipment, they attempted to overthrow Dudoyev's separatist government. Ten hours later, the oppositional forces and the Russians pulled back with their tail between their legs. Starting the 1st of December 1994, Russia began its intense campaign of aerial bombardment. Russian Minister of Defense General Pavel Grachev gloated that he could take down his government in a few hours with a single air regiment and said that it would be a blitzkrieg or lightning war. But was that the case though? Surely, yes, Russia had superior air power and could just completely bomb everything in Grozny, everything in Chechnya, in fact. But would this win them the war? Even if they did hold the land physically, did they really win? That's what regular people would think, right? You hold their land, you win. But that's not true with the Chechens. The Chechens, as long as they're alive, they didn't lose. And the Russians knew that. They knew that holding land would mean nothing. A small complex of only partially bomb-proof shelters and trenches carved from the earth. The sound of Russian reconnaissance planes overhead is almost always heard. Marsud, veteran of two Chechen wars, explains his camp is reasonably safe from Russian intrusion. According to him, his opponents are often afraid to be caught in the forest after dark says the Russians try not to venture too far from their garrisons. The Russians only control where they are at any given moment. 
where they park the tanks, that's what they control. Their initial attack on Grozny was delayed heavily after General Edward Voroboyov resigned and said it was a crime to send the army against its own people. Emil Payne, Yeltsin's advisor on national affairs, as well as General Boris Polyakov, and Russia's very own Deputy Minister of Defense, General Boris Gromov, who predicted it would be a bloodbath, as well as 800 of the Federation's troops all resigned and pulled back from supporting Yeltsin's attack on Chechnya. During the course of the combat itself, some Russian units refused to continue on orders to advance and sabotage their own equipment. The soldiers really didn't know why they were there in the first place, and their morale was at an all-time low from the very start. Russia eventually recaptured Grozny again with constant bombardment and gruesome urban warfare. And on January 19, 1995, they seized whatever was left of the Chechen presidential palace, despite losing thousands of their own men to the shock of the Russian public. Of course, they didn't exactly manage to kill any of these big Chechen enemies. Everyone just went for the hills. Russia wasn't going to win by capturing and holding the land of the Chechens they would have to kill them. Russia soon began its campaign of assassination attempts against Chechen leaders. And between January and June of 1995, through relentless bombing campaigns, the Russians did a lot of damage to the people of Chechnya. And by late June 1995, has seized control of much of the land their rebels had liberated. So it was midsummer 1995. Russia was knee deep in the first Chechen war and causing widespread chaos and disorder, not only within Chechnya, but actually within their own media and military. But they still physically held most of northern Chechnya at this point. Khatov had just turned 26 and he chose to step back into combat. He was looking for another campaign to support. He had briefly heard about this issue in Chechnya, but he hesitated because he thought it was a nationalistic civil war. After all, it was a former Soviet air pilot, Dudayev, who declared independence. And so he didn't exactly understand right away until he connected with Shemil Basayev, someone who we will talk about later, and he learned more about the cause. And when he found out it was an Islamic struggle to defend the Chechen land from the Russians, he started to round up volunteers for the journey. He actually had to, as he says in a recording, find it on a map. He didn't know where Chechnya was, but he knew his mission. And so the journey with his comrades began. Including their leader, Ibn al-Khattab, there were only 12 men willing to come with him to his newest campaign, to the mountains of Chechnya, which by the way is a place that we've explored before. Imam Shamil and Sheikh Mansur started the fight against the Russians 150 to 200 years ago to protect the lands of the Shishan and Dagestan from the hands of the are. And now, the wolves of the North Caucasus demanded their freedom again. And so they set off to Chechnya, where they would work to liberate them from Russian control, following the Russians to punish them once again. And so Khattab and 12 men entered Chechnya in late 1995, expecting to spend very little time there. Khattab went there for training purposes. He was preparing to holster his gun and possibly explore efforts in the Balkans that were happening around the same time, which he actually ended up being involved in, <clears throat> the Bosnian War. But he saw the enthusiasm of his men and he was scared to leave them. He didn't want them to lose morale. <laughs> And very soon, within his very first week in Chechnya, in his first operation, he killed 41 Russian soldiers, taking out five armored tanks. Five of those Russian troops were actually officers. This was his very first few weeks in Chechnya and he already cost the Russians thousands of dollars. And very soon, within the same two weeks, he would strike once more. He led another attack, destroying 32 Russian vehicles in an ambush near Karachoy, south of Vedeno. 41 were killed, five of them being officers. That is almost everybody on the convoy, except 12 Russian soldiers who climbed out of the last tank and swam for their lives across the river. The Russians were starting to lose a lot of equipment, not that they had noticed. They were being very reckless in this war. Or they just wanted to end quickly. It ended up ultimately backfiring. The equipment fell in the hands of the Mujahideen as they collected thousands of dollars in RPGs. And this would come in handy very soon. On April 16, 1996, Ibn al-Khattab led one of his first major operations, Operation Shatoy, where he led the attack by 48 men of the Arab Battalion and executed one of the largest offensives against the Russians to date, destroying 47 out of 100 Federation armored vehicles and tanks, killing 223 Russians, 26 of them being captains. <laughs> Зашли туда, не знаем же, ни улиц, ничего, первый раз 
Ни табличек, ничего по карте ориентироваться бесполезно. Так ехали на угад, куда пойдем. Всю роту разбомбили, еле выбрались на вокзал, там вообще добили. С вокзала убирались каждый как мог. A few months later, the Chechens struck a Russian military post, destroying important air equipment and taking new weaponry, such as Grad rocket launchers and five new military vehicles, allowing for more ground-to-air accuracy. This devastation caused a dismissal of three Russian generals. The Russians wanted to shake up their personnel a bit. This campaign could go on for no longer. They wanted this to end as soon as possible. And in August of 1996, Ibn al-Khattab participated in one of the most vital operations of the entire war, Operation Zero Option, led by Shamil Basayev. <laughs> Shamil Basayev, also known by his war name, Emir Abdullah Shamil Abu Idris, met with Khattab upon his entry into Chechnya and actually connected with him in Afghanistan. One thing was known about Basayev. He wasn't going to be handing his gun into anybody, and he was not going to sheath his sword until the Russians withdrew. This led to rather controversial hostage situations led by Basayev in which he held a school and a hospital hostage, demanding a ceasefire from the Russian bombardment that had made Grozny the most destroyed city on earth. I just want to say I don't condone this. I don't condone bringing innocent people into a war. And neither did Ibn al-Khattab and many of the Chechen top leaders. But at this point of the war, Basayev had lost a lot. And you can tell it was starting to affect him psychologically. He was willing to do anything to end the war. A targeted Russian airstrike in 1995 thundered down his uncle's home, killing six children, four women, and his uncle, his wife, and child, and his sister Zenaida. Twelve additional members of his family were also wounded in this attack. His brother was killed in a battle near Vedeno around that same time. Basayev had lost so much to the Russians, and he needed this war to end now. And so he resorted to what he thought that he had to do. I don't personally agree with this. But during the hostage crisis, with Basayev, the Russians responded very calmly and diplomatically by opening fire on the school with a machine gun and trying to battle their way in. This resulted in hundreds of casualties on the sides of the children and the teachers, and of course the Russians blamed this on the Chechens, but Basayev and most of the Chechens inside the building escaped. Thankfully, the hospital hostage situation was signed off peacefully, but of course the Russians didn't follow a single ceasefire agreement made. But anyways, let's get back to Operation Zero Option that Shamil was leading. The night before this offensive, a contingent of rebels led by Ahmad Zakayev attacked and raided a Russian military railway, taking multiple RPO rocket launchers. This detail is very important to keep in mind. These rockets will be vital. 5.45 AM, it was a cool August morning in Grozny, as it usually is. The Russian Ministry of the Interior was sitting with their legs kicked up on the desk in the heart of Grozny, reporting any crazy news right back to Moscow. To be honest, it was 5.45 a.m. They were probably just waking up. But for theatrical purposes, just imagine that. This was the Moscow-controlled region, the heart of Grozny, Russia's eye on the Chechens. With the Russian flag flapping in the wind overhead, the Russian Interior Ministry and the Republican FSB headquarters in Grozny. Little did they know, Chechen Mujahideen would be seated at these desks within the next three hours. Five minutes later, at 5.50 a.m., around 1,500 Chechen rebels silently entered Russian-occupied Grozny and started to make a rapid advance through the Russian checkpoints in the city. They silently slid past several checkpoints at a time, quietly blitzing the heart of the city, and the Russians weren't aware for hours. They strategically routed Russian ground troops within checkpoints and stations to divide them into several little pockets of resistance, and then they turned around and surrounded surrounded these checkpoints, having 10,000 Russian units surrounded by only 1,500 rebels. Absolute genius. Their goal wasn't to engage in head-to-head -head combat. They wanted to take the heart of the city, the Moscow-controlled region in the center, divide the Russian ground forces and stomp them out one at a time, and then annihilate the backup as it comes in. They seized Grozny and pushed the puppet government out. Lo and behold, the backup came as expected, but very late the next day. In the afternoon of August 7th, a Russian armored column rolled in one at a time and received a free RPO missile each. 
The next day, another Russian armored column arrived and were sent back, minus several tanks and personnel. The question for the Russians started becoming, is it worth it? But regardless, the Russians ignored peace agreements and continued stumbling forward recklessly. On the 9th of August, 900 men of the 276th Regiment tried to take the center of Grozny as the Chechens did and were sent limping back, with 150 of them killed and 300 wounded. Peace talks finally were met after weeks of pointless swapbacks. The Kasaf Yurt Accords were signed, and in mid November 1996, a reparations agreement followed to allow for refacilitation of the Chechens affected in the 94 96 war. The Russians actually committed a lot of massacres during this time on Muslims in the North Caucasus. Random people they thought to be implicated or involved in the war disappeared randomly. Hundreds of innocent random Chechen villagemen disappeared after the August 1996 Chechen takeover of Grozny and were presumed killed by the Kremlin. These massacres caused more and more Chechens to join the resistance. Go figure. Ibn al-Khattab was directly involved in this operation and after its success he was given the Medal of Courage and was awarded the rank of Major General in a ceremony. Khattab was different from other commanders and he was soon about to show how. He would do solo recon missions, visiting targeted areas before him and his men executed an attack. This gained him notoriety and caused him extreme success in his operations. He knew the ground he was on like a grid and kept track of the most arbitrary details. <laughs> Despite these treaties and agreements, Russia continued to execute attacks on the Caucasus Mountains, targeting militants and capturing and vanishing anyone they deem responsible. They also continued their economic embargo on Chechnya and prevented humanitarian aid from reaching them. And this was actually a propaganda point for Russia. They tried to use this as an opportunity to show the world that the Chechens couldn't take care of themselves and build their own state, saying that the Chechens couldn't even take care of themselves economically without the Russians, when in reality, the Russians were the reason that they couldn't. Regardless, the Chechens started opening countless facilities and programs to teach Quran Tawheed and a course for Islamic principles and basics. Soon, military facilities started popping up as well to train these young men and bolster the Chechen military. During this time, Khattab was known for his community work, helping out in running these facilities and training the younger guys. According to the former president of Chechnya, Zalim Khan, he was known for taking care of the needy. He bought a cow for an orphan family and took special care of the impoverished within his camp. <laughs> Russia continued their economic embargo and Chechnya. They had Chechnya surrounded on all sides as they still had control of many other territories in the North Caucasus. And so they lined the border of Chechnya with Russian Federation troops. And so the Caucasus, as Khattab says, Tamurru ila marhalatin jadida. وهذه المرحلة هي التخلص من كل أنواع من التوجد الروسي في القوقاز. Complete eradication of the Russian presence in the Caucasus. The Russians were still interfering in Chechnya. Khattab caught within his own camp more than 38 FSB agents, all assigned a certain person to assassinate. December 2, 1997, the Chechens began executing small attacks in Dagestan against Russian loyalists, stirring up some concern in the Kremlin. The Chechens knew that Russia was going to come back once more, and the Russians still had control of the formerly Islamic Dagestan. They entered Dagestan and bested the Russian forces, forcing them into a withdrawal very quickly. The Chechens gained support in Dagestan, recruiting fighters and advocating for the establishment of a new Sharia government, one that didn't take bribes and commit kidnappings like the old and actually current Dagestani government, led by a literal criminal. Anyways, the Russians didn't like this new support that the Chechens were getting from the Dagestanis, and they started becoming concerned. Soon after, the Russians took revenge on two innocent villages that weren't even involved in the war, besieging them with air and ground attacks. And soon they started attacking random villages and building Russian bases in Dagestan along the Chechen border, with support from the Dagi government. Basically, any village that they considered implicated in the Chechen effort became a public Russian enemy. Keep in mind, these villages were almost exclusively women and children. 
The Chechens persisted for a week that the Russian operations in Dagestan ceased. They gave them an entire week, but the Russians refused, and soon after, they actually entered Chechnya. The Russians began building posts in Argun and surrounding regions, and the Chechens mobilized and positioned themselves throughout the hills between Gudirmis and Argun. And for the next 10 hours, as the Russians drove their convoys past this hill, 47 Russian armored vehicles were taken out, as the Chechens rotated striking Russian convoys from several directions. 20 days later, on the 22nd of this December 1997, Khattab actually penetrated 100 kilometers into Russian territory, destroying nearly 300 military vehicles and almost everybody inside them. At this point, Russia couldn't exactly conquer Chechnya until two men were gone. And they were Samir Saleh Abdullah Suwailim and Shamil Abu Idris Basayev. The assassination attempts on these high-ranked Chechen commanders continued. Two explosive assassination attempts on Khattab failed, but the Russians relented, as they weren't ever going to take a stroll through Chechnya as long as he lived. They needed to take Khattab out, and they couldn't do it in a normal combat situation. Around this time, a new criminal took charge of Russia. Former FSB head chief and administrator under Yeltsin later became acting president in August of 1991, and solidified it four months later, in December of 1999, Vladimir Putin took control of Russia. If you don't know what the FSB is, it's basically the new KGB. They do the same thing. They're the KGB with different initials. Putin wanted to prove himself to the Russian people, and his strategy was winning this war, but first he had to convince the people that it was a war that was actually worth winning or even fighting over. Mysterious terror attacks started happening around Russia, all which Khattab made an official statement denying responsibility and clarifying that his war wasn't against civilians. Russia claims that Chechens committed apartment bombings in 1999 that killed around 200 people and provided zero evidence. There was zero reason to believe that this attack was done by Khattab, especially considering it was an insanely tough job to coordinate remotely and would require the perpetrator to have serious connections within Moscow as well as the capability to penetrate Russian security several times with zero force and without raising any alarms. Yeah, apparently Russia was facing Loki. It became clear that these attacks were done by Russia, by Putin himself. But regardless, this was his chance to rebrand this as a war on terror, and soon he would get his perfect opportunity. This also was a strategy that he used to calm down the Russian mothers who were crying about their sons being murked one at a time in a war that had nothing to do with them. He tried to use this to convince them that this war was a threat to national security. The main reason that Russia wants Chechnya and Dagestan or any other terror in the North Caucasus so that they can continue to export oil out of the Black Sea and out of the region. Yeah, that's right. That is the only reason all of this is happening for oil. The war continued, and led by Shamil Basayev, the rebels fought a fierce battle and managed to free Vedeno on August 13, 2001, despite Russian bombs indiscriminately destroying everything, and succeeded in pushing out Russia's forces. But alas, Soon they would receive some terrible news. On March 20th, 2002, a spy working with the Russians handed Khattab a letter meant to be from his mother. The letter was heavily poisoned on the inside and as soon as his fingers settled on it, the poison started to make its way into his body. And soon enough, his nerves were cut and his lifelong wish was true. Ibn al-Khattab had become il Shahid Khattab and he was buried in the dense forests of the Chechen highlands. He fought to the death, encapsulating the Chechen spirit, as well as many other Chechens who continued to fight and defend their villages for years to come, even if they had to fight one or two against an entire battalion. The Chechens continued to give them hell for years, with countless stories of the final stands of ferocious warriors, who stepped up to save their home villages, and ruthless Chechen women leading operations to avenge their lost husbands and children. Going through all the stories would make this video about 2 hours long at its shortest, so I will not be doing that, I'm sorry. Between 30,000 and 100,000 Chechens were killed, over 500,000 were displaced from this conflict, 200,000 civilians were wounded, all because of Russian airstrikes that left gaping holes in the lives of the Chechen people, who fought back with bullets of Nur. The identity of Khattab actually remained a secret for many years following his death until an interview taken by his brother, 
Omar, which was his brother, had countless footage of him in battle, with many operations being filmed, such as the Chateau ambush featuring himself and Ruslan Galaev, also known as Black Angel, or some afternoon swimming with his Arab comrades in Afghanistan. Khattab would send these to his father and brother, and his father was taken aback by the respect and admiration Khattab's men had for him. He knew that it would have been a mistake for Khattab to return to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had his plan for Fattah, and nobody can deter the plan of God. May Allah give strength to the Chechens to reestablish themselves and free their nation once again. And may Allah bless the rest of the Muslim Ummah and allow them to raise themselves out of the ground and learn about their true identity. And I think that's going to wrap it up for this episode of the Black Banners podcast. I hope you have an amazing morning, afternoon, noon, night, whatever it is for you. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hello, Akbar. Hello, Akbar. Ready?